Okay, welcome everybody. Um, welcome to the class. Uh, everybody just give me a signal that the audio is working. Give me a vote on that. Cool, great. Audio is working. Everybody's here. Um, welcome to the class. Just wait a few more minutes for everybody to filter in, wait, and figure out. Let everybody figure out what's going on, uh, and then we'll get right to it. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to post the link to the GitHub repo, which we're basically going to start with today. So I, po I apologize; these links aren't clickable yet. But if you copy this, and then you can find this uh, GitHub repo, which is on the AI Core GitHub, or you can just go to GitHub.com/ai-core. time we just wait for people to come through um, yeah so I can start by explaining um, what is this course and what is the AI core um, so whilst I do that another good thing to know would be um, who's new here so upvote that if it's been if it's your first time here um, downvote it if it's not your first time here and let me know it's not my first time um, so yeah this is the deep reinforcement learning course which we're going through here this is me here um, I don't know what he's doing um, but he's helping me teach today and so yeah so basically this is the online classroom it's the, the first version of the online classroom which we're which we've been working on to basically try and bring the teaching which we did offline online um, and so the way it's laid out obviously I guess you can you guys can see what I can see which is my screen here it's me up here um, and there's the chat it's like the main form of interaction we have at the moment you can order that by recent or by upvotes um, we did want to have the group lobbies working as well so you can talk between your peers here and we really did think we had that working today after we did some tests, but there seems to be some errors right now. So you can't see the streams and you can't share streams uh, between people, but we're gonna continue to do this anyway and make sure that's fixed as soon as possible. Um, and that is the reason for having your webcam and screen share shareable so that you can guys can help each other, learn from each other, and we can drop into the different lobbies and do the same. So for now, um, yeah, basically we'll have to we'll have to resort to using the chat. Um, if anybody does have any success and sees someone else's face in the, the group lobby, um, just, yeah, be friendly and let us know. Give us a comment in here. And, yeah, otherwise, let's do this. So, like I said, here is the link to the repo which we're going to go through today. So what you should do is you should go to this GitHub repo, which will lead you to this link. If you copy that um, and these are a bunch of different files and no specifically notebooks which we're going to go through uh, over the next four weeks um, the one we're going to start with which you should open is uh, not that one it's what is RL so uh, you should get that one but you shouldn't open it in github what you should actually do is um, download it so clone and download, copy that, go to your terminal and do git clone that repo um, or just download the zip and then open that. And what we're gonna wanna do is to move into that directory 
which we're copying all these files in, and then start Jupyter Notebook. And that can run these files. I'm sure a lot of you already know this, but that can run IPy Notebook files, IPy NV, and that shows the code with the explanations. I'm not going to run through that. So go into that directory, and then for me, it's pretty easy. My system seems to work. For other people, it's often not. So I just type Jupyter dash notebook and run that. Um, if you have Anaconda, maybe you want to open Anaconda, click launch Jupyter notebook, or um, maybe you know how to run Jupyter notebook some other way. But now you can see this is running on a local server on my computer on port 8888. And I can go to that file, which I described what is RL. And this is the Jupyter notebook, which we're going to walk through today. Um, actually, we're going to walk through much more than this. This is just the start one, I think. Yeah. Okay, cool. So I failed to check out upon cloning. Anybody? Yeah. So let me know if you've got any issues right now. We'll just make sure everybody's um, together. Failed to check out upon cloning. What do you mean? Yeah, I had that issue too. Um, I was having issues with the screw photo, trying to remember the zip and extracting it. Okay, cool. Um, what does that mean? Why does that come up? Um, check out I, know, I think there's like one of the file names has got like some odd Unicode character in it or something like that. That okay. uh, might be a Windows thing because I know on your machine it works. Yeah, thing. you're probably on Windows and that's why it's not worth the yeah, intent. Um, cool. So yeah, cool. So this what is RL file? I, I thought this is a longer one. It's actually not. It's just the beginning of another another one. Which I'm gonna go through, through go through in a sec. Um, but yeah, like just let me know if there's any issues here, um, and then we can we can sort them out. But otherwise, yeah, I guess everybody has this um, this file open. You got this repo downloaded. You open Jupyter Notebook, and you come to this file. Now we can start doing reinforcement learning. Start learning about that. So, what is reinforcement learning? Is the first question, um, and if you've done any kind of machine learning, or if you're with us for the deep learning course that we did the other day, you will have heard that there's basically three major paradigms of machine learning currently. Uh, supervised learning, where you have data sets with features which each have labels. Unsupervised learning, where you have the same but no labels. And reinforcement learning, which is a slightly different kind of thing, which is where you have this, what you call agent environment loop. So you have some agent, some maybe like player in a game or any thing which can exert, which has some agency on its environment. That is, it can influence its environment. And it does influence its environment by taking actions. The agent makes actions which manipulate the environment. The environment then returns you a new state, having trans transformed as a result of your actions and a reward signal to the agent. Um, so it's like obviously very simple, but very general framework. And this is the framework used to um, describe reinforcement learning problems, um, which all kinds of problems can be can be framed as. Uh, so obvious ones, as I've just hinted, are like you have a video game character and you want to play it and you want it to play a game. Um, you know, this is the kind of thing where it's like it would be hard to gather a data set of um, inputs and outputs. So like features and labels, which would allow you to do supervised learning. Um, and instead, we have to kind of do something, do something a bit different. So uh, yeah, ask any, ask away any questions you have about that. But that's basically the very basic paradigm of reinforcement learning. And so yeah, this is a way to train machines to perform tasks by having them interact with their environment and rewarding them when they do well. Um, so yeah, we affect the environment by taking some actions, observe a new state of the environment, and may receive some reward or a negative reward, punishment. Uh, from the environment for taking the action in that time. Uh, reinforcement learning is inspired by humans, by how humans and other animals learn from interacting with our environment. Um, so for example, dogs can be, can be trained to perform tricks by giving them rewards, treats, when they perform correctly. And then, when they, then they understand that when they're in a state that you might offer them a treat, and uh, then they can learn to perform the action which will most likely lead to them getting said treat. Um, so there's a few examples here you can click through if you want to check out some different examples of reinforcement learning. Um, and yeah, I mean, it would be good. Like if anyone has any like cool ideas, um, of like 
maybe what do you think reinforcement learning could be used for? Put that here. That will be good to hear. Um, yeah. All right, cool. So there's a question already. Um, how is that different to linear regression? Um, a machine can change the environment, gradient and intercept, and its reward is a loss. So linear regression is just a kind of model. Um, that is, it's a mathematical function for representing an input-output relationship. Um, and in reinforcement learning, we are going to be building lots of models um, which represent that same thing. So input-output relationship, that is maybe your input is what you see, output is what action do I take. Um, the first obvious thing is that that relationship is certainly not going to be linear. Um, the, yeah, the output of... of, of um, some agent you know playing a video game where they have say a million pixels in his features the relationship between those a million pixels and whether it should move left or right is is definitely not a linear relationship it's something much more complicated um and that kind of uh hints to why this this course is called deep reinforcement learning not just reinforcement learning um al although today we'll mainly cover reinforcement learning um, we'll go on to deep reinforcement learning, and that is using deep models, for example, neural networks, um, to represent uh, the input-output relationships which we might want to model. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's it's not it's not um, it's not linear regression. Um, for example, to do linear regression, you need a you need a supervised data set of labels as well. So um, it's really nothing like that, but the uh, linear regression is a model and we're going to use models in RL. It's probably the similarity. Um, cool. So, uh, so yeah, we'll go here. Difference between RL and other machine learning paradigms, unlike supervised learning. Uh, so here we have um, an agent with explicit goals. Um, sorry, I'm not quite sure what this is meant to mean, but the main difference between RL and other types of machine learning is that we have an agent that can interact with his environment and influence it, rather than just map from any input to output. So in RL, which is short for reinforcement learning, if you haven't already picked that up, we don't explicitly tell the agent when it does something wrong or right. It's just informed by a reward at that moment. That is the reward returned from the environment. Um, and this is not necessarily indicative of whether it will do well at the task in the long run. So for example, um, you may have a robot which receives a negative reward every time step because its battery is going down and that's a bad thing but that you know that might not mean uh, it, it, even given that it might still do a great job of say cleaning the house um, although it experiences a negative reward every every time step um, maybe it just achieves one big reward at the end like plus 100 whatever it cares about right um, and that's up to us to code and design so uh, yeah, contrast this to the case of supervised learning, where we have a label for every input and every uh, for every for every input, and upon every um, prediction from the model, we can let it know whether it was right or wrong, and how wrong it was. Right. So if we have a label, we make a prediction. We can compare our prediction to that label and see how wrong it is. In the case of RL, um, every like firstly, it's like much harder to gather a data set um, for a lot of problems. For example, if you're training a robot. Uh, to do something in, in the real world um, it's very time consuming to get together that um, data set um, but also every even if you have a run through where the robot does something really incredible you need to be able to understand how to attribute um, credit to each different actions which the robot takes in the right way so it may take like really bad actions all, all the way just until the end and then do some fantastic move uh, the end where it um, then gets a whole load of reward um, and if you're attributing all of the um, reward which you got at the end to those moves which it, which it got um, the bad moves which it did until near the end well then you're assigning it positive credit for doing something bad um, so in that case you can't just use like a uh, you can't just use like the final reward of a game or of a run through or a trajectory we call it um, to assign how good each action on that trajectory was. So um, yeah, please ask questions because it's uh, much easier for uh, me to then basically guide the guide the, the class in the right direction. Um, cool, so does RL relate to certain concepts from control theory? Um, so reinforcement learning basically is a way that you can learn control. Uh, just refresh this browser. Um, 
Cool, yeah, so RL is a way that you can learn to perform control. So, because what we have is basically a um, something that we want to control, and that is an agent. And what does it mean to control it? Well, it means to make it do what we want. Um, and this is basically, this can be framed as a reinforcement learning problem. As long as we figure out some reward signal, which we're going to give our agent, then we can um, basically give it a heuristic, which it needs to follow to understand when it's controlling the thing well. And the actions which it chooses to take will be the controls which it, it applies. Um, cool, so can we apply, apply deep RL to text-based games or do we need pixel uh, data? Um, yeah, you could definitely apply it to text-based games, but I mean, yeah, you can apply it to all, all kinds of things, honestly. It's like really doesn't matter what the specific format of the, of the um, input data um, or the game or whatever uh, is. Um, but yeah, it can be applied in, in all kinds of kinds of different domains, even things like translation. Um, and there's a lot of examples of stuff out there like that. Um, and to be very clear, reinforcement learning is not just for games. Um, it's for all kinds of things. Um, like, yeah, like I just mentioned, like translation, for example, like that's nothing like a game, but you could frame it in a way such that um, there is some there is some reward for um, some form of communication and that agents have to develop say a language between themselves to achieve that reward and that is um, uh, and that can lead to basically some uh, some understanding of translation and those kind of things um, also it could be used to uh, so someone mentioned control yeah basically control of anything to my point not just games but it could be like to control the um, the, the actuators on a uh, on a power station or something like that to maximize um, electricity production and that would be a pretty simple um, task to frame because there you have a metric which is amount of electricity generated per unit time um, and you can then take actions that is manipulate different um, parts of a power station to try and literally just follow that single number and see when that goes up and down even though that may be an extremely complex relationship we could use a neural network to um, model the relationship between those two things. Uh, and through reinforcement learning, we can build models that can account for um, maybe things like delayed rewards, as well as extremely complex relationships. Cool. Um, yeah, cool. That might be what some of you need to do. Uh, if, if, if you haven't already, just try and like, oh yeah. Okay, actually, so we're going to go on to another notebook now. This is not the one I originally thought it was. So what is RL? That's a very basic start. Um, actually, is this? Yeah, okay, so intro to RL is the one we want, not what is RL. Um, so basically, this is the main thing of what we're going to do today. Now that we know what reinforcement learning is, what are we going to do with it? Well, we have made this very simple game which is called Gritty, which is a four by four grid currently um, with a agent, the black square. And that, that, that agent can take actions in this grid world to move up, down, left or right at any point in time. It could take one move per unit time and it gets a positive reward when it gets to the pink dot at the end, which is like some food or something. Okay. Um, so, uh, any questions so far? Any questions about that? I really wish this was working. Testing, testing to come. All right, did I miss anything else? Uh, do you only send the reward signal at the end of the task or each step? Um, you can send the reward signal um, at any point um but basically you know i mean maybe like you just get zero reward at some time steps but um in general and what we're going to do today you're going to get a reward every time step uh not just at the end of the task um but for example say we're playing something like maybe you've heard of um dota 2 or starcraft those two games which um uh forget which way around it is but open ai and DeepMind have respectively been trying to build AI agents, specifically reinforcement learning agents to battle. Well, those games, basically, you don't know how good you're doing until you actually win the game. Similar, maybe a simpler example is like chess, for example. 
um, you, regardless of how many pieces you capture of the opponent, it's like you don't actually know the true value of them until you win or lose. You might capture all but two pieces and then they beat you with those final two pieces. Um, and uh, so in that case, we might want to frame the problem, and this is what they actually do in Dota 2 and StarCraft, um, give them what they call sparse rewards. And that is, that is one form of that is they only give a single reward plus one at the end of the entire game. So there's actually no reward attributed until that point. Cool. Um, yeah, again, like please, 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 th please throw more questions in here. Um, it's a bit hard to understand what you guys do and don't get what I've explained clearly and not so clearly so far. So please, just like if you have any comments or interesting ideas or questions, like please put them in the chat. Um, I'm here. Niha is with me. Uh, Haruna's downstairs. Christian is online. Killian is online. Everyone's here to help and make sure that we all understand what is going on. So any issues, yeah, please just please just shout. Excuse me. Um, so, uh, yeah, what are we doing? So we're going to basically start this game gritty. And uh, the main ideas are that we need to firstly create our environment. We need to initialize the environment. So basically that means like, well, where does the uh, agent start and where does the food start? Um, and then another main idea is that we can increment the simulation ever by one time step by calling env.step action. So we create our environment, which we call env, then we do env.reset to reset it back to um, the start of an episode. And then we uh, do env.step to take one time step forward and we give it an action, which is gonna take at that time step. So. This is totally based on um, the OpenAI Gym framework. So I'll just show you that quickly. And this is basically OpenAI's um, selection of environments, which you can, which are basically designed to uh, get better reinforcement learning baselines. So here is a this page, which it leads you straight to, is basically a quick um, explanation of uh, how to make it work. Um, and yeah, so basically this is one game called Carpol. So here you do what I'm saying, you do, so you import that library gym, you do gym.make, so make the environment, reset the environment, and then for a thousand steps, render the environment and take a time step, which is a, um, which is a random sample from the action space of the environment. Um, and then it will look something like this. It's gonna take some random actions and it's gonna play that environment. Um, We'll get onto that and we'll do that in code ourselves. Um, and then basically what's returned from env.step is these four things, observation, reward, done, and info. So we just care about the first three really, but observation is like, what's the next um, state, which is transitioned into. Reward is what reward did the um, game return to the agent at that point. And done is whether, it's, uh, whether the game is finished or not. Like either it's been completed or the agent has failed to do it. Um, so here's how that might look, and this is something similar to what we'll do um, for Gritty, and we'll also do it for Carpol and more complicated environments over the next four weeks. Um, but yeah, so we make the environment, um, get the observation from resetting the environment, then for 100 time steps, we'll render the environment, select an action by sampling from the action space of the environment, and then we'll get these four things, as I said, from the uh, step function. And in that step function, we'll pass the action which we're going to take and then close. So this env.render, this basically shows us what the environment looks like at that time step. And so that's every frame of this video. Cool. So um, uh, yeah, take a look through this. And more importantly, more interestingly even, take a look at the full list of environments here. And you can see all the different kind of stuff which um, you will be able to apply the algorithms which we learn throughout the next few weeks to solve the different games. So we'll just have like a little five minute break there. Um, just I've got some food here, thanks to my friends. Give me any questions you got and then we'll resume very shortly. Cool, we'll resume at 32 minutes past seven.
Sweet. Oh, thanks, man. Appreciate that. Oh, shit, I'm still on my audio. <laughs>
Okay. And we're back. Um, cool. So, yeah, you're using uh, Colab. It will not recognize Gritty ENV. That is because um, Gritty ENV is a file which we have here. This is a, a, um, an environment which we've made. So what you need to do is you need to take this and you need to um, install it in Colab. So go to Colab. And then um, you go on. You can also do this thing. Wait, wait, if you take the GitHub link, then you can paste that here. So we could do something like this. But anyway, um, you do that. And then you have, uh, I think, like file and then you can upload so you can upload a file here basically you need to upload that file um either open a notebook and then it'll be on the left hand side or you can do that from here i guess um cool let me know if that gives you any trouble um who found a cool environment which we should try and post a video of us solving let me know which one it was in here um um, yeah, there's a good question here. Um, would it be viable to give small rewards values to actions which tend towards positive outcome? Uh, yeah, I think Nihir gave a good answer there. It's like, yeah, but the game doesn't give us those reward signals. Um, we'd have to learn those for ourselves, and they can be extremely entangled with other moves which might play out through um, some trajectory which is like thousands of time steps long or even millions. Um, uh, to get an idea of like how long games are as well, um, obviously this is totally problem dependent. But for example, um, in like Dota 2, well, how long is a game? I don't know, it could be like an hour, maybe, probably realistically, um, uh, or it could even be 10 minutes. And then, so then you've got uh, 600 seconds, and then what's the frame rate of the game? So it might be 60 FPS. So the product of those is like giving you really big numbers, um, even over short time spans. So there's like, maybe you can take multiple actions per second, and maybe the action space is extremely large. What we're trying to do here is just highlight like reinforcement learning is it gets very complicated very quickly and this really shows why we need um you know well it highlights that what we want to be able to do is to abstract and comp and compress extremely complex um informational inputs which may have billions of values um and we want to be able to find high level features of those like am i doing good or am i doing bad if we just had that single signal it would be cool we could just follow the good stuff um and so we can use deep neural networks to uh do that um ex feature extraction for us which we'll get onto. um and this was actually the bit i want to talk about so um by extension can we send external rewards to our agent um i assume what you mean here is that uh we can do reward engineering as it's called so even though we may get, um, for example, from cart poll, we may get the uh, uh, the reward is, I think, what is the reward actually? Let's just look up. I think it's like, yeah, so plus one for every time step the pole is upright, okay? And the pole is upright when it's uh, between 15 degrees from the vertical on either side. Well, we could actually choose to give it a different reward. We could do some reward engineering, as I said, um, and basically say, okay, actually, the reward is proportional to how vertical or is inversely proportional to how far from the vertical it is so that if it stays more vertical it gets more reward and i guess that would be an example of what you're describing which is providing an external reward to the agent to indicate um how well it's doing uh, so yeah absolutely we can do that and then but the problem here is that the the agent and the model which it learns to um do the uh state to action mapping is then biased by our own inputs. So we could say, like I said earlier, the example of playing a chess game, um, we could say that the reward is how many pieces you take. But like I said, you could take all but a very few pieces and still lose the game. So even though you, you know, even though you you might have thought that would be a good heuristic, it could turn out not to be. And so you've biased it to um, some behavior which is not actually solving the problem you want to solve. It's like that behavior would be great if the aim of chess was to capture as many pieces as possible and the loser was the was the one with the least remaining after some time period or something um but in fact it's not and so this is actually um it's interesting that uh what we've seen is that some of the ways which have led to solving extremely complex problems like dota 2 um with that which is like a, a, a real world uh, what do you call it game um and like what has led to solving some of those problems is keeping things very simple 
and literally just providing a plus one or a minus one at the end over a whole game, which may be you know millions of frames, uh, millions of time steps long. Cool. So yeah, let me know if there's any more questions. I'm really happy to go through them. Um, thanks. If the task is more complex, you may initially have to go back to the task and then just respond. What was this one? So I was thinking about circumstances where we are just play and take the fashion. Um, uh, it's most likely is more limited use cases. Um, yeah, I mean, you, you, you could do reward engineering to, um, to you know, make an agent behave in a particular fashion, as long as you know how to describe that fashion, right? So that may be easy, or it may be extremely complex. Like if it were the power station, okay, I want you to minimize the number of the, the volume of water, which is taken to cool the station. Um, that might not be so easy to understand how to make it perform in that fashion, right? There's a lot of controls which happen from the control room, which make a bunch of processes work. And the end of that, some heat is generated, which the water is need needed to cool. So like that, how, how do you get it to play in that, to, 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 to perform in that fashion? Um, it's kind of hard to uh, come up with what reward signal you should use for that. Um, and there's obviously a lot more examples. I'm sure you can think of, um, let me know if that was an answer to the question. Cool, another question. Thanks. If the task is more complex, so you initially have to go backwards to win the task, would you still have a reward at each time step? Um, for example, in finding uh, in a route finding task. Um, yes, so even though um, you might need to go backwards physically, the time would still progress forward, though, right? Um, so, uh, so would you still have a reward at each time step? Yes, you would. Again, let me know if that was on. Ask a question. Cool. Yeah. Please, please ask questions, guys. Um, if you haven't asked a question, you should definitely ask at least one. I'll give you some attention. Cool. All right. So, um, where are we now? Now we're actually gonna implement this. Cool. So, how would I do this? Um, well, this is just using this thing which we import. So we import gritty env and then do that, and we can run. That cell and that worked cool so now our environment is an instance of the gritty environment which is this thing so um yeah here's that agent environment loop which i described earlier so um yeah and so basically what does this mean well Without any prior knowledge, the agent has to learn about the game for itself. Just like a baby learns to interact with its world by playing with it, our agent has to try random actions in the environment to figure out what, co what causes it to receive negative or positive rewards. And that can be any kind of um, setup that we can frame in this way. So a key piece of jargon here, um, a function which tells an agent what actions to take from a given state is called a policy. That is, the policy maps from states to actions. So for example, we might have our green agent here, which can take these blue potential moves, either jumping straight into the fire or straight towards the gem. Um, and the policy would look at the state and say, what action should I take? Or maybe like, what's the distribution over the actions which I should take? So a good policy would say, go right. Or if it were a distribution, it would say, most probably go right. Um, and a bad policy would say, go to the left. Cool, so policies can be deterministic or stochastic. They can have some randomness in them. Um, so it could be, like I said, a distribution, in which case it wouldn't always go right, even if it had a good policy, it might you know, go a different direction um, with some random probability. We're gonna implement this today. So um, mathematically, a policy, uh, yeah, it could be, like I said, a probability distribution of actions, or it could actually just output a, the, the, um, the discrete action as well. But uh, more fundamentally, a policy is a function. It's a mathematical function, which is gonna take in this in the form of numbers and output some more numbers, maybe just one particular number representing a certain particular action. So how does this stuff we've seen so far, the agent, the actions, the environment, um, and the reward, and the policy, look in our case so uh we have an action space 
which consists of four unique actions. And these are represented by four numbers, zero to move left, one to move right, two to move up and three to move down. Um, that's our action space. We also have an observation space. Um, and so how does our observation look space look in the case of Gritty? Well, we've got a uh, four by four spatial grid. So we know there's gonna be at least 16, um, there's gonna be at least 16 numbers there. But actually in each of those uh, 16 spatial locations, we need to represent what's there. So, and um, in Gritty, there can either be uh, nothing, like over here, there can be the agent, which is that black square, or there can be um, the, the gem, or there could be a wall. We haven't implemented that, but it is, it is basically set up to go. Um, there could be a wall there. So this is what the observation space looks like in, um, in Gritty. It's basically a four by four matrix with three layers. And each of those different layers represents, um, uh, is this thing in this position? So for we'll have a, a four by four grid with zeros where there's no goal and one where there is a goal. Same thing for, for where there'll be walls. There's no walls in this version we're gonna play today, but um, and the same thing for the agent. We're gonna have a four by four grid which represents um, all the different uh, positions in the game. And in the positions where there is an agent, there will be a number one. And in the positions where there's not, there will be a zero. So on that state transition, when we do env.step, this is what's returned to us as the observation. So remember, step returns us four things. And the first of those is an observation. In our case, it's, uh, it's this. It's a three by four by four grid. Um, cool, and we've simplified the code by including lines that convert this tensor into an integer. Um, so yeah, just, just to make visualization easier so we don't have to visualize all these different numbers. We can just visualize like, oh, is it in position zero or 15, whatever. Cool, so now um, what do we need to do here? Um, so this is a function to visualize the agent. I'm gonna walk you through this. So um, it's called visualize agent. It takes in a policy, which is again, remember, a function which maps from state to action. Um, and it's gonna do this many trials. It's gonna do n different trials. So it's gonna go um, for each of these trials. It's gonna reset the environment. Initially, is it done? No, so set that to false. Initially, time is zero. While it's not done, so I'm gonna keep doing this loop. I'm gonna render the environment, um, get the agent position. This is that line um, that we were talking about, uh, which turn, oh, sorry, the, 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 this highlight part turns the um, state into, uh, or turn, turn, returns the agent state into um, a into an integer uh, like that, right? So basically this state represents which position we're in currently, and the policy is gonna take in this integer and return us an action. So here is the, um, codified example of what I've been saying. A policy maps from state to action. Very simple. Um, and then we're gonna use that policy action to take a step at every time step. So we're gonna do environment, step the environment with some action. And then we can, um, yeah, basically get these four things. The one we really care about is the observation. Um, although, as you can see, we're not actually using that anywhere. Um, Anywhere. Oh no, sorry, yeah, we are in the, in the next time step, yeah. Cool, so, um, cool, and then we just wait a small amount of time so we can see it in real time, and then increment the time step by one. And then re-render the environment uh, after the game is done on the final time step. Pause for 1.5 seconds um, until it's done, and then print the, the episode finished after how many time steps. Um, cool, so now what I want you guys to do is implement a random policy so I'm sure you can guess what that means, but what it means is a policy which takes in a state and outputs a an action like all policies, but in this case, the random policy outputs random actions. So I want you to spend um, one minute filling in this uh, function. So it's gonna take in this, which is an integer, and it's gonna return you this, which is an integer, um, which is within our action space, okay? And then we're gonna run this function. So you should be able to um, implement that and then run this function. Cool, so yeah, one minute. Uh, please ask questions.
So what does it mean that a policy can be deterministic or stochastic? Um, well, this means that given a state, a deterministic policy would always choose the same action. A stochastic policy would choose, um, would select an action from maybe a probability distribution. So it might not, well, it won't always take the same action. That's the characteristic of being stochastic. Um, but what you ask here, does deterministic mean that a set of actions will always lead to the same result? This is a different question. This is not about the policy being deterministic. This is about the environment being deterministic. Um, so the result which you get from taking any action depends on how the environment transitions. Um, and so this, uh, just like the policy, can be deterministic or stochastic. The transitions of the environment can be deterministic or stochastic. For example, in the real world, you know, maybe it's random that the wind blows in a certain direction. Um, and that might influence which which position your robot actually ends up in. Whether it maybe it, you know it takes the takes the action to go right, the wind could not blow and it could end up in the position on the right, or the wind could blow very strongly to the left and end up in the position to the left. So that's um, stochasticity in the environment. Another form of stochasticity. Stochasticity. Another form of um, yeah. Another introduction of difficulty into the reinforcement learning problem. Um, so yeah, like we said, stochastic, stochastic policy could return a distribution, um, or it could also just um, pick a pick a random action with a small probability, something like that. Uh, which yeah would be a form of distribution. Does a state depend on the step on the steps taken in the past, or is it only its current position? It's um, so it's not necessarily only the current position, but it is what you call uh, Markovian, which means the 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 present. Is in, sorry, the, yeah, yeah, the present is independent of the past. Um, which way around is it? Yeah, the state is independent of the past, basically. All the state, um, all of the past is summarized into the current state. So um, for in a, in a game like chess, for example, um, this is obviously true. Um, the state of the chessboard, doesn't matter how we got there. It's like, it is what it is, and we're gonna have to play with that. It doesn't matter that, um, you know, there's no such thing as like momentum of pieces or anything like that, which would be time dependent. However, if there were, you could just basically say that the state of the, the the current state is made up of the last ten board states or something like that, right? That could be the current state. You could bundle them all together so that there is uh, no dependence on the past um, for any particular state. Cool. Um, yeah. Anybody having any issues with the video pausing or lagging? If you are, upvote this comment. If it's all good for you, downvote it. Um, you might not be able to save the whole course. The solution published later on. Yes, actually, um, the solutions are all in this notebook. So intro to RL solutions, that's all there. Um, but don't look at them unless you need to. Don't look at them, please. Because um, I'm going to go through them anyway. And you're going to learn more that way. And you'll learn even more from doing them yourself. And um, But they will be here if you need them. Absolutely. And also, so will this recording. Cool. So what are the elements of the agent position? Uh, what does it contain again? Yeah, so the agent position is a um, is a tensor. It's a four by four by three tensor. So where does the three come from? There's three different channels um, in this stack of four by four um, matrices. So the four by four represents the spatial locations on, on in Gritty. And then basically what's in that space. So there's three different things which could be in the space either the agent, a wall, or a reward. Um, and basically each of these layers is a, a binary map of whether that thing, that agent, is in the position or not. Um, cool, so yeah, let me, uh, let me know if um, that makes sense. You've gotten the agent to render, but it's not taking any actions. Um, okay. Um, not quite sure about why, um, but uh, I will basically go through this and um, let me know if there's any, if it still doesn't work after. Cool, so we got, um, we need to take an action. Um, do we have anything imported yet? I can already use. Yes, we have NumPy as MP. Okay, so um, MP, I'm gonna do, my action is gonna be NumPy, I'm gonna get a random, um, random integer rand int uh, between zero and three and then i'm going to return that, that action so uh yeah 
numpy.random.randint returns you an integer within the range um, inclusive of the start and exclusive of the uh, end. So if I run that, cool, I'm run this one. There you go. Now my agent is taking some random actions. Um, uh, why, so why would this not be working for you? Um, maybe you're in collab, in which case I'm not sure how this is going to render because it's running remotely. Um, let me know if you're in collab. Um, otherwise, yeah, basically I haven't changed anything except from the fact that um, my uh, I filled in this action. What you should do to debug this is to uncomment this line. So if you uncomment that, it's going to print you the policy action every time step. If it's working, but not just but just not rendering, then you'll see it print all of these, right? However, if it's not working, if it's not running through this loop, you won't see any of those prints, or you might just see the first one or something. Um, the whole point of debugging, the whole process of it, is to narrow down where is the error happening. Um, so you should print something. If you don't see it happening every time step, that means something's going wrong every time step. Otherwise, if it is happening every time step, and maybe you put a print on the end here, like print uh, ended, well then you know it's run the whole thing and you just haven't rendered it, or it hasn't been able to render maybe on collab, something like that. Cool, so just do it all the time. Um, cool, I actually wanted to do it without the policy action, so I don't get that anymore. Because we're gonna use this function a lot later, so I don't want to have any useless prints in. <clears throat> so what we're seeing is that um, how long did it take the agent to finish the game? Um, the agent always starts in a random position, so this is going to be uh, maybe longer sometimes, even if it follows the same optimal policy. But um, in general, we hope to see this get number getting um, lower. Ideally, it will be as small as uh, there are time steps or the, the number of position, the number of positions it is away from the uh, from the goal when it starts. Cool. So. Um, anybody have any issues with that or understanding that? Cool, working now, nice one. Um, great. Yeah, please let me know uh, how it's going. Um, yeah, someone just put something like enthusiastic or fun in there and then, uh, and then I'll upvote it. Sweet, best comment. There'll be an award for the best comment. <laughs> All right, so next section next section how do we know if we're doing well is a question we have our agent in the environment now we know the environment's working we know we can take some actions but how good are these actions is the question um so w w when we take an action move it to a new state the environment transitions um we get a reward back uh, in our case um we're getting a reward plus one if we reach the goal and zero everywhere else um but the reward doesn't actually tell us how the how good the move actually was it just tells us what did it sense at that time step so it's like you know maybe you're going on some long ex expedition and you take an hour to write a plan of what you're doing for the expedition now in that moment you wasted your time like you didn't get anything done you just wrote some paper but in the long term that action was very useful it you know it's certainly better than not making a plan um for what you're going to do on some long ex expedition so just well you know a simpler example is um the one i said about the robot earlier it was like battery goes down every time step that's a bad thing but that doesn't really mean that the moves it's taking at those time steps were bad it just means that it didn't sense anything good at that time step it doesn't mean it's not performing well so what we can gather from this is that the reward is not a good indicator of how good the agent is doing it's not a good indicator of how well we're doing not at all um at least most of the time so um, what we care about really is the sum of the rewards, um, specifically the sum of the future rewards. And this is what we call the return. We call this, uh, yeah, we call this return, we, we, uh, the notation for this return is capital G. So the return at time step T is basically the sum of the future rewards. So the reward at the next time step and the next time step all the way till the end of the episode, until the, the end of the trajectory, okay? So this is how we can write that. We just write sum over um, all the future time steps of the reward of that time step. Uh, so the question is, is 
getting the reward now as good as getting the same reward later? I'm going to ask that out. What's better, reward now or reward later? That's enthusiastic. Love it. Um, come on. Get riled up and do something. Do something exciting. Say some interesting stuff. Upvote this if it's um, reward better or um, downvote it if it's better to get the reward later and give me a reason why you can reply to all these comments with these arrows. Um, let's go. Cool. Why? Why would it be better to get a reward later? Any ideas? Um, yeah, anybody having any issues with anything as well? Anybody not been able to get that to run? Anybody not been able to open Jupiter or find the notebook or whatever? Um, literally, if there's anything wrong, Gad, let us know. Um, and we will help, but we can't if you don't last man. Cool, so, um, yeah, I'm just gonna take like one minute break here, eat something, and then we'll come back to this. My teaching is so good, everyone started clapping. Thank you, thank you. <clears throat> so, um, reward now, better than reward later. Why, why would it be better than later? So, zombie gave, um, so yeah, sacrificing short term for, for long term, interesting. Um, we don't wanna preemptively reward an action. Yeah, that, that is right. Um, but the thing is, we do wanna get the rewards. We do want to accumulate as many rewards as we can. Um, and um, we basically, we, we don't want to assign the, um, assign the credit to the, wrong, to the wrong actions, but if we know what actions get us the right rewards, we do want to, um, uh, we, we do want to get the rewards. So basically um, we do want to get rewards uh, sooner rather than later. So basically a few um, uh, things you could imagine about this so for example like what if what what if you say okay cool i'm gonna get that reward in a bit and then the next time step it's suddenly gone it's gone from the game it's removed removed by god um or you know it's like the obvious question like would you rather be rich now or later well if you're rich now you can you can do more with it and you can be richer later um or what if a larger reward is introduced and you don't have enough energy or time to reach both or what about inflation um you know, these are all kind of reasons why you it is better to get the reward 
sooner rather than later. Um, or at least like that's a pretty good, pretty good heuristic to follow um, empirically and uh, and analytically all the time. So um, a little diagram, you see the, the gem deteriorating over time steps. Um, and we basically want to be able to encode this into our return. So what we're trying to do is like um, get an indication, just a reminder of how well we're doing currently. And so we can use the return to calculate that. But what we want to do is actually calculate the, um, the discounted return as, as it's called. And that is the return which weights near term rewards higher than long term rewards. So this means that like, um, yeah, basically I'm going to combat against these things and get rewards as soon as I can, when I can, or at least up to a limit. Um, and well, how is this controlled, you might ask? And that's through this um, parameter, gamma, the discount factor, which is a number between zero and one. And this is basically going to scale how much do we care about this reward at this time step. So, um, and basically, yeah, put into the equation like this, right? So the first, um, the next reward we receive is not discounted as it's not pre-multiplied by gamma. The next reward is pre-multiplied by gamma. Um, and the next reward after that is multiplied by gamma squared and the next one gamma cubed and the next one gamma to the four, et cetera. And that, and that goes on. So basically the further, um, the, the, the further uh, ahead in time rewards are, the, the, they're decayed exponentially by the discount factor. So yeah, this basically the coefficient weights further further rewards away um, by a lesser number than those nearby. So it prioritizes nearby rewards. Maybe you're looking ahead and you're predicting what's the return if I go into this move by turning left or this move by turning right. And I can say, well, um, depending on how I discount them, um, maybe I'll get in one, I'll get a higher total of return. And then I can get an indication of like, how well will I be doing in that state? And that's what we want to get to, right? If we knew how well we were doing in every state, that'd be great because then we just, um, you know, we could do a bunch of things. So we could either like look ahead. Um, one thing we could do is look ahead and say, how good is that state? How good would I be doing over there? And then you can just take, do that for all the different possible states, which you could reach in the current position and then move into that one, whichever has the highest uh, time step. Sorry, whichever has the highest return. Um, cool. So now this is how we can write our discounted return. So now the only change here is we've got this, um, this uh, factor of gamma in here. So we're going to sum from the current time step, which is I, um, uh, well, yeah, which we're using the parameter I, um, which starts at T plus one all the way to capital T. So that's the total number of time steps. And this is the current number of time steps, but one in the future. So the return I'm going to get for at time step T is whatever the future reward is. So this will be R T plus one. So reward in the next time step. And this will be gamma to the one, or sorry, gamma to the zero in this case. Um, uh, cause we're subtract. So T plus one minus T minus one. So this would be zero. And then, yeah, basically it just lays out this equation. Cool. I don't know if you've got a problem with that. Um, all right. This is the discounted return. Um, yeah. And this is basically the one we always use. So from now on, we'll just refer to this as return. Which is called the discounted return, the return. We're never using actual return like this. Um, yeah, so once an agent's played a whole game, we can uh, look at the we can look at the different time steps and we can basically, you know, we can have written down all the different rewards that I got at each time step. Then we can go to any time step and we can say, okay, look at look on my list and see what rewards did I get and how far were they in the future, how much should I discount them by? That tells us. And then we can calculate what was the return from that um, from that time step, okay? Um, and we can also express that recursively. So now, if you notice, uh, we probably should have another line in here showing this recursive definition a bit better, but um, GT is RT plus one plus gamma GT plus one. So if you compare that to this, right, you see the same thing here, GT equals RT plus one times plus gamma times something. So what's in this in this something? It's all of this at the end, right? Or all of this basically. And then if we factor out gamma, then we'll get well RT plus two plus gamma RT plus three plus gamma squared RT plus four. And that would be this GT plus one. Yeah. So like I said, we can express um, discount, we can express the return recursively. 
um, by working our way uh, backwards. So we'll start off with the um, with the, the the G for the final time step. So G capital T that would be. And well, at the final time step, time step, there is no next time step, so there is no next reward. So it's zero, right? The um, the return for time step capital T is zero. Then we just use this equation and say, okay, well, the return the return for G T minus one was the reward at capital T um, plus gamma the return at capital T. We know that was zero, right? So the reward in the penultimate step, um, or like yeah, the the the, the final step. Um, was the reward which you received as you entered the uh, terminal state as it's called the terminal state is the state which you enter where the game ends um, <clears throat> um, okay so yeah we can do that and that process of starting from the back um, starting from the uh, starting from the end and working our way backwards is called backup so we can do backup like this like I just described starting with G capital T and calculate the returns for every time step within the game. Uh, and the return of a terminal state is always zero. Yeah, that's what I just described. Cool. So, so, so why is this useful, right? Well, if I can understand how good was a state, how good was how good was this um, particular state where you know I experienced that at time step T in my game, um, or in my entry any any kind of environment and you know that was just on one run right on one run i saw that this state had which i visited at time step t had this return so how might we how might that be useful Does anyone have any ideas like like what why, why would that why would that be a good thing to know if i know the return i got for one particular time step in one particular game why might that be something useful or how might i use that so let me know if you've got any um, ideas about that. And I'll answer some questions in the meantime. So the question is, yeah, like why is the return useful? I wanna see some answers to that, please. So at the end of one run, do you have the return for each of the squares in the grid? Um, at the end of one run, we receive an overall award for the episode. Um, okay, right, so the question is, so at the end of the one run, do you have a return for each of the squares of the grid? Not necessarily. You only can, firstly, you don't have the return. You have to calculate the return using the rewards which you experienced um, throughout the whole trajectory, right, and do backup, like I said. But do you have them for every square in the grid? Well, not necessarily. Only if you visited it, right? Only if you've actually seen what, what if you experienced what return you got from that that grid. If you never went into that grid square, you don't know what it's like there. Uh, what's the time complexity for the discounted return calculation considering its recursive nature? Um, let me have a look. Um, probably linear, right? Because, yeah, it's just... Yeah, I mean, just like every time step, we add another term, um, but it doesn't get any more complicated than that. There's no... Um, we're not raising to the power any of these um, previous uh, previous calculations, right? So there's no like exponential exponential um, number of computation need to be taken place. It's just linear in time complexity. Cool, good question. Uh, this is also a good question. Um, Cool. So someone has put, um, so why is return useful? It's useful because it's a measure of how successful the agent was for the entire game rather than for the single action. Well, the return at any given time step is just how how much reward it got from that from that time step, right? For, from that position. It's not necessarily a, a, a measure of, um, of uh, well, I guess, yeah, like the higher return, yeah, more, more successful. Um, cool, yeah. Uh, rather than a single action, yeah, great. Um, that's exactly right. It, um, yeah, it definitely means that we're not just attributing all the value to single particular actions. We're looking at um, trajectories ahead, but it's not it's not quite what I'm, what I'm what I'm what I'm looking for. What I'm looking for is how can we use it? How can we use the return next? Okay, so the answer is to someone said to make decisions on which state to progress to out of the four options for movement. Which square you're moving into has the highest return? Right, interesting. Okay, so um, 
yeah, that, that's good. That's in the direction we're going to go. Uh, so you find the best policy to maximize return. Um, yeah, that is the goal. That is the goal of um, reinforcement learning, basically, to find the best policy to maximize the return. Um, well, to maximize uh, the total reward, um, which is basically the return, but not quite the same thing, um, because return is discounted uh, and only future. Um, so yeah, in, in general, yeah, that's what we're trying to do. Um, uh, why is the bedroom scribbled with formula? Yeah, because because we've got so much to teach. We've got so much to teach, and there's nowhere else to write it. Um, are we calculating GT after our agent went through a whole run, having attained all the rewards, or objecting the, reward, the possible rewards somewhere else? No, we're calculating. Sorry, we're um, we're doing what you said, former. Um, so we are calculating the return after the agent went for the whole run. So it's like step one, play a whole game. Step two calculate the returns for every step in that game. That's what we're going to do. We're actually going to write the code, so you'll see that as well. Um, cool, yeah, so I like this one. This one um, is a good answer. Um, so this someone also said, uh, because it can utilize the learning in the next game, I mean, yeah, that, that's the hope um, of machine learning is that we can, well, and reinforcement learning in particular, we can use experience interacting with the environment to, um, yeah, to perform better in the future. So why is it useful? Someone said it's useful because it can be used to determine the best action at each state. Um, yes, but only indirectly. And I'll explain um, the answer, which is a combination of that and that. Um, cool. Yeah. So um, good question. Um, right, so basically the answer which I was looking for is basically, and this was to do with the way I asked the question, which was, why is it good to know a particular return for a particular episode? Um, well, I mean, the idea is that if we play many episodes and experience that same state, then what we can do is we can get an average of the return. And this will tend to be the correct value for how good is this state, right? How much how much reward can I expect from this point on? Um, prob problem with a single uh, with with doing this from a single episode is that you only have one data point, right? It might be that you just got really lucky one time and that the I don't know the fire didn't burn you as you ran through it, or that you know um, the bear didn't eat you when you went into its cave or whatever, right? Um, and th those would be kind of like um, uh, out of distribution samples. What you want to do is sample um, a state many times to understand that in general, yeah, it's pretty good or yeah, it's pretty bad or exactly how good is it, right? How much um, return can we expect from that? And this is basically going to be the next step. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to um, create what we call value functions. And this is the measure of how good is each state. That's one way of measuring it. So we know how to calculate the return, um, which is in this particular game, how good was this state? How much reward, um, how much discounted reward did I get from here on? Or how much return did I get from this state? And what we want to do is basically play many, get many games, many different episodes, run many different trajectories to see on average, like what is the actual true return of that, of that state? Yeah. How much reward can I expect from here? So, um, and we call the, we call these um, estimates value functions. So we're gonna have um, some value function uh, for a particular state. And this is basically the average return when the state is that, is that state, which you're given, right? So the value of a state is the average return for that state given a particular policy, pi. Okay, so we use the, the character pi um, to symbolize a, any, any yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a variable which represents the policy. So to say that thing in whole, um, yeah, the state value function for policy pi is the average return from state s following that policy pi, right? So yeah, the value function tells you on average when I follow policy pi, how much return do I get? Okay, so yeah, note like it, it, it's not a value function. It's a value function following a specific policy. 
it's not just a value function, it's a value function following a specific policy. Every value function has an associated policy, right? Why is that? Because, well, how good a state is depends on the actions you take, which is the policy, right? If I'm right next to the goal and I always jump into the fire, it doesn't matter how close I am to the goal because my policy doesn't work. I have an awful policy and the, the value of that state would be very low, even though it could be very high if I had a good policy, right? It all depends on the policy and every value function has an associated policy. Cool. So, um, now, oh, we're going to get some code eventually, I think. Yeah, all right. Um, any questions so far about value function? Yes, this is this is exactly the answer. Yeah, each run you can update how good each space was depending on the return and improve your moves next game. Yeah, so what we're going to do next is try and figure out how do we use the value function to um, improve the moves next time. So, so yeah, what have we got for, so far, right? We've got agent in environment as some policy. Um, it's going to run that policy. It's going to it's going to experience a trajectory, um, and then we can calculate a return for each state which was visited within that trajectory. Um, if we average the returns over many different games, then we can get a, um, a value for that for that state or a state value we call it. Um, we can get a state value, and now the question is, what do we do with that state value? The idea is that we want to use it to be able to perform better, um, to be able to uh, take actions which maximize the total uh, future reward. Um, so that's the next step. How do we how do we use value functions to do something useful? Can you give an example of a policy, please? Yes, yes, of course. Um, my policy is code in the day, sleep at night. Um, or you know, my policy might be um, uh, like in in the case of gritty, it might be like go to uh, i mean like we'll, we'll, we'll see we'll see like very complex concrete example of policy but policy is like a very general thing it just is how you behave right that's probably before the session what you knew a policy as a policy is a way that people act given a certain situation right um you know what's the policy on um on dealing with all kind of events in government right that's just kind of like that's the rules that's the protocol that they're going to follow given some particular state um the policy in uh the policy in like dota it might be like you have a big convolutional neural network which scans over the whole image and produces you a, a vector of 100 different numbers which are 100 different actions and they're all probabilities for um taking those different actions a policy maps states to actions um let me know if there's anything more uh, specific but um, we're going to implement a policy so you will see it under all these assumptions of a constant environment are all these under on the assumption of a constant environment states do not change over time um yes they are however you could incorporate any of the moving parts any of the changes into the state as well right so um you could also have maybe there's like another agent in gritty in the four by four grid world in which case maybe you just add another channel so it'll be a four by four by four tensor now and the final um uh the final channel is basically the position of the um of another player and so basically any position they're in well that's all accounted for in the state now right so the states yes they may change but all that information will be encoded in um what you actually have as your observation in a fully observable environment which may not always be the case um again like uh, starcraft an example starcraft is not a fully observable environment you only see a small part of it at a time um, so you can only act given that information <clears throat> so our value function is always policy dependent yes how does our value function change with a better or worse policy um uh how does the value function change with a better or worse policy well it depends um i can't say like values will go up or values uh will go down because um depends on your policy um but like the value functions as you train like the value function will become the true value function for that given policy right so the value function is always it's totally dependent on the policy 
And as the policy changes, so does the value function, because the value function is saying like, um, how good will the policy do from here? And in the, in the opposite sense, the policy is saying, um, uh, how good is the, um, yeah, what am I gonna do based on the value function here? Pretty much. Cool. So, um, yes, like it, I like it. Um, are you learning a policy or is that manually updated? We're gonna learn it. Um, but you could you could just write it down as well, right? Um, so we also have another game, which I don't have an example of, but um, it's called Snakey. And it's basically where there's a much bigger grid and you have a snake which leaves a trail everywhere it's been. And um, we made a game where uh, people basically, there was many snakes in the environment, all controlled by different people's algorithms, by different policies which people had trained. And, um, you know, and it was pretty hard to get a good policy. So someone just like hard coded it and they manually wrote down the policy, which said like, yeah, go in a spiral and then trap all the other snakes within it. Did pretty well. Um, cool, so are you learning a policy or is it manually updated? Yes, we're gonna learn it. Um, cool, yeah, please send in any more questions. Um, What does that mean, states do not change over time? I thought they do change over time. Well, states don't change. Um, state is like a discrete representation of the environment at that point. Yeah. If you have time step one, your agent is in cell zero. Time step two, it's moved to the left, right? So that state has changed, right? No. Well, I mean, you've moved into a different state, but the state hasn't changed, right? State two is still state two. State one is still state one. But okay. now your agent is in state two, yeah. Okay. And so the example I gave was like, well, maybe there's another player in the in, in the environment then, right? Well, then, yeah, the states actually like they they do change, right? Because even though the, the physical space stays the same, the actual environment changes because there's another agent moving around. Yeah. However, you could just incorporate that agent as part of the environment, yeah. Exactly. And then every position that they move is um, just basically another potential state. Um, and this kind of should highlight to most people, it's like the the state space explodes exponentially um which is why we need to do deep R -R. cool um can we create a policy which utilizes a varying list of actions um a varying list of actions um yeah i'm sure um but you know it's like you you need to have some function which represents your policy it's like the, the the actual structure of the function can't change, but the, the parameters of it can change. So um, maybe you have like a function which takes in a four by four grid um, or a four by four by three grid in our case and outputs um, like a vector of four numbers. This is exactly what we're gonna do. Um, and and basically like you, you that that's the side that's the shape of the of the observation and action space. It's like it needs to be those two things, right? It's, it's like, it can't change. And if we did suddenly like remove two of the actions, well then the function would be different. Um, however, like we can just, we can kind of inject this using the parameters of the function. So we could have like another input, which is, I don't know, maybe it's like over time or something, you're saying like action four becomes less probable. Well then we could just have another input to our model at some point, which it, it could be right at the end, just before the final, um, before the final like transformation, if we have many transformations, um, and it could just like pre-multiply that by like one over the time or something like that. So you can influence the um, the probability of taking any actions, sure. Um, and as such, then you can basically uh, manipulate the varying list of actions. So maybe it's just like beyond time step ten, it's it pre-multiplies the output probability for action three by zero, and then that action is effectively removed from the um, from the output of the policy. Cool. Um, right, yeah, so what did you say here? For example, that times at T, we say, yeah, yeah. Cool, yeah, did, did that make sense? So that, that's exactly why I described actually, it's like beyond time step, say 10, um, we can just like pre-multiply like some of the actions by zero or something, and then redistribute their probabilities over the other actions. Cool, good question. Um, so, all right, yeah, any questions just ask. Um, so now we know what a value function is and we know a lot of other stuff. Now I'm basically gonna talk about the Bellman equation. So what is this, is this complicated looking 
thing, basically. What do we want to get to? Um, well, what we can do is we can express the value for any given state um, as a function of the next state, which we go into. So just like we did the um, the uh, the return recursively, we can do the same thing for the um, value function. And what does this actually look like? So um, basically we have this thing. What is this thing here, right? This is the probability of going into a new state, S prime, and receiving a reward, R, given that we were in a state S and we took action A. So in state S, I took action A, what's the probability that I ended up in some other new state with some particular reward? Um, and you know, I could I could take a bunch of different, um, I could end up in a bunch of different states and a bunch of different rewards depending on you know the stochasticity of my environment. Um, and yeah, um, and then basically, you know, all of these are just a probability. And if we sum them up, they're all going to equal one, right? In our case, um, the probability of ending up in a state which is to the right of me with a reward of zero, given that there's no goal there, um, yeah, with a reward of zero, given that I'm in the state to the left of that and I take action to the right, it's like that's going to be one, right? Because there's no randomness in our environment. Um, so basically what's happening here is like, we're saying like, what is the, um, weighted reward plus discounted next reward, right? Or next return. So the value is like, how much reward do we expect to get from here? So this is essentially our, um, our return, right? Um, yeah, but there should be another section here actually basically saying, this but for value so if you just replace v uh replace g with v then you get the same thing right so we can just say basically the value is equal to um uh the 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 the, the next um the reward i get this time step plus the discounted value but this is like multiplied by the probability of making that transition okay so um i'm gonna basically make a weighted sum I'm going to weight each different um, next reward and future reward that I could get from here. I'm going to weight all of them over um, over the different transitions that could happen, right? Given that I takes my particular state from my particular state, my particular action. Um, so basically, like, what's the weighted average of the next of of the return that I can expect from here? That's all this is saying. Pretty simple. Um, although it looks complicated, but yeah, I mean, I can go over that so many times um, just to make sure it's a bit clearer, but like the value of state S given policy pi is how much weighted or basically how much future return I can expect given follow, following policy pi and the way I'm weighting the, um, the likelihood of getting this next reward and then discounted future reward is by the probability of this transition happening. So this transition, um, uh, yeah, it just basically says like, um, you know, what's the likelihood of me going to a new state and getting a new reward given I took state S and was in action A. In our case, although there may be many combinations of new states you could end up in and new rewards you could get, um, all of them, but one will be zero and the other one will be one because obviously it has to sum to one because it's a probability distribution. So in our case, like how, how many how many different probabilities will we have? Well, we'll have how many different states are there I could move into in Gritty, right? There's 16. I could move into 16 different states um, and I could either receive plus one or zero. So therefore there's 32 different probabilities, um, which are the probabilities of me moving into that state and getting this reward given I took uh, action A in state S. So let's say I'm in the top left square in position zero. What's the probability of me moving to the bottom right hand square? Well, zero, right? Like that's not going to happen at all. In fact, the only actions that I can take or can or the only transitions that can be made in Gritty are ones to adjacent tiles. Um, and in Gritty or in this version of Gritty, there is no randomness. So if I take action to the right, I end up to the right. And so 
out of those 32 numbers, all of them will be zero except from one, because I'm absolutely certain that given that I start in position zero, top left, I take the action, move to the right, I'm gonna end up in the tile number one, which is just to the right of that. And then I'm gonna wait, how much reward will I get going into that, um, in, into that new state, into state one, um, plus how much future return do I expect from that state? And so this is a recursive um, way of expressing the value function, okay? Um, okay, and where, oh yeah, okay. And where does this come from, basically? I guess is what this section is about. So, um, oh, actually this is a Bellman optimality equation. So the, um, What's the point I need to get to here? So basically, what do we know? How So this is how we can write this, right? Like this is true. This is the Bellman equation. This is how you express value functions recursively. Now, what if we were acting as good as we possibly could? We were acting optimally. Well, then how would this thing change or how could we manipulate it? Let's walk through that. So what I'm looking for, and I'll have solved reinforcement learning if I can get this, is V star. I'm looking for the optimal value function, or that is the value function of the optimal policy. So it could be like V of pi star um, for the state S, right? Well, the optimal value for this state S is the maximum value that I could get for that state following pi for all different possible pi, right? If I look at all different possible policies that I could ever take and I maximize the value of this state over them, well then I must be performing optimally because every value is as high as possible. That is every state I can expect to get the highest possible um, return from it. So um, how can we rewrite this part? Well, we can use this thing Q which is, is just like V actually. So it's just like how, how good is this state, but it's how good is this state and this action. So how good is the state action pair, right? So, um, well, if we were following the optimal policy and then, um, well then the, so basically, you know, the, the maximum, the optimal value of this state is the value of the state maximized over all different policies, which is the same thing as if I were following the optimal um, policy and I maximized this Q over all the different actions, right? So I, I was follow, following an optimal policy. I looked at all the different, um, uh, well, I, I looked at my current um, state and then I looked at all the different actions which I could take and I chose the one which gave me the best. Well, then this would give me the optimum, this would give me the highest um, value. The, this could be the optimal value for this state. Okay, well then how can I express that? Well. The like I said, Q is just like V, right? So Q is like quality. It's, it stands for, um, although that doesn't really mean much in this context. Um, is the quality of that given state um, state action pair, right? So it's just like V. It's the um, return I can expect from the state, but Q is actually return I can expect from the state and this action. Return I can expect from the state taking this action A. Okay. Um, and so this, this is like the thing we saw earlier where we had like V is the expected um, return given I'm in state um, S, but now I'm also in action A as well, right? So very similar thing, very similar thing here. Um, okay, so how can we, um, how can we uh, basically rewrite this, which is the highest value, which the state could have? Well, again, I could maximize over all the different actions, the expected return, for this state action pair. Um, and now this will be as high as possible if I'm following the optimal policy, right, pi star. So if I um, just undo this uh, recursive definition of G, well then I can put this here. So when we said GT equals RT plus one plus GT plus one. Um, so that's just the recursive definition we saw above. And then I can say, um, well, if I'm acting optimally, with this optimal policy, well then g t, g of any t, is gonna be as high as possible. This return that I get from this state is gonna be as high as it possibly can be. Um, 
And so we know that V is the average of G. So the val value is the average of the return. So um, if, if we're acting optimally, the return is always going to be as high as possible. And that means that we can replace this with the highest possible value for this state. Now, note that none of this depends on the policy anymore. So we can get rid of this policy here. Now, now we're not, now we're not um, um, uh, basically, we're not estimating, we're not taking the average over the policy, we're just taking the average over um, all the different uh, experience. So none of, none of this depends on the policy because we've moved that into this V star. Um, so now we get to this point and we've again expressed the, um, the value function recursively. And so what does this say, right? Well, now um, we can take this um, R plus gamma V, which is basically like next reward I get plus discounted future expected reward. We can write that like this. Um, just with the small characters to represent um, variables rather than specific instances of the return and the state. So these are just like any return and oh sorry any reward and any state. Um, and then what does it mean to take an expectation? Right, it just means like take a weighted average. I mean take the average, which means take a weighted sum. And so what's the um, weights that we weight the likelihood of getting each of these um, uh, of these returns from well it's the probability of moving into that state right so if i again just be really clear on what this is this is the probability that i move into a new state and receive a reward r given that i was in state s and i take action a it's a transition probability this describes what you call the dynamics of the environment how does the environment change over time how does it change each time step given my current state and my current actions well if I looked at all the possible places I could end up, all the different um, new states and rewards which I could receive, well, they are all reachable with some probability, although maybe that probability is zero. Um, and so that's it. And then, you know, if I move into that state S prime, well, then this is the um, return I can expect from there. So um, that's why I want to weight this by to get an average of what is the return from this state. Right? And that's that's what V is, remember? V is the average return um, for a particular state following a particular policy. But in this case, it's the optimum policy, which allowed us to make this move, which allowed us to um, put the uh, V star in here. And so now what we can say is that the optimal value for state S following the optimal policy um, is the maximum weighted average of the return when you consider all the possible actions and that's what we've got here. So we've got this thing, which we call the Bellman optimality equation. If you scroll up to here, you can see this more neatly without all the rest of the, rest of the derivation. That was pretty in depth as well. So don't worry too much about that. Um, and uh, yeah, give me a shout out if you think that was, that was good. Um, so wh what, is, what does this mean? Where have we got to now? Um, we now, have a representation we have a recursive definition for um v star right so now we saw that this is always true this is true when we're acting optimally so now we have a representation like a check we can check is this true is the left hand side equal to the right hand side for our problem and if it is well, we just derived this using the optimality. So we know that if these two things are equal, if the left-hand side equals the right-hand side, we must be acting optimally. And that is the punchline of this section. So I'm just gonna take a one minute, take a drink and chill out. Please ask any questions, because that was pretty in depth. Like I said, the main point here is that we can use this equation to check, are we performing optimally?
does his spell off magic poison that we apply that we can get an optimal result from even the worst possible policy. No. Um So this is like so where, where does this break down, right? I mean in the in the first step, if 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 we will um so we need to maximize the value of a given state over all possible policies, right? So it's like by definition, it's like a bad policy is 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 not gonna give us this value. Um because a good policy will make the value as high as possible because this is the return we can expect from it. It's the, it's the, it's the future reward. Um, so no, we need to be following the best policy, the policy, and that is the policy which maximizes the value of this state. Um, is getting the highest return a guarantee that the action is the best? Couldn't the highest return mean the highest short-term reward instead of the long-term reward, right? Um, the first thing that comes to my mind is like, depends on your discount factor, right? Um, should have explained this clearly, but like, high discount factor, that is close to one, um, means that uh, the future rewards are not discounted. They're, you know, they're weighted equivalently to all the near-term rewards. Um, and so in that case, like, the agent will consider further um further along rewards with you know equal relevance and in that case it will act like a bit more um long term and if we have a low discount factor one much closer to zero well then the um the future rewards are going to be decayed um much more significantly and you will get like a short-sighted or like myopic we call it um myopic agent um Cool. So, uh, is is it a guarantee? Is the highest return is getting the highest return a guarantee that the action is the best? Um, so, the return is not dependent on the action. It's dependent on all the future actions, right? Um, the return is not actually dependent at all on the action which led to that state, right? So you have a return for a state. Well, so, sorry, you have, a, you have a return for a time step, um, and at that time step, you're in a certain state. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so, so the return is not um, for, is not for um, the current time step or any particular time step, it's for all the future time steps. Um, so if you're getting a high return, then that action is better than if you were getting a low return. Is it the highest? Is is getting the highest return a guarantee that action is the best? Um, so getting a highest return, no. By getting a highest value and having a value function converge, yes, I'm pretty sure, um, because that means that, on average, say over like an infinite number of um, trajectories, uh, we've seen that this state gives you um, a high uh, high return, and that would indicate that it is the best action. Uh, sorry, it is the best state. It is the best state following the current policy, right? But when the policy changes, the value function changes. And we're going to talk about this in a bit. No, the state changes, doesn't the value function change as well? Sorry? When the state changes, doesn't the value function change? Uh, the value function is a function of the state, right? Yes, yeah, so when the state changes, the value function gets done and something else. Something yeah, else I mean, there's a val so value function for every different state. Cool. So, um, is knowing part torch and transfer a prerequisite for this course? No, um, it's not because we're going to walk you through it. And obviously, you're going to ask any questions you have and anything you're not clear about in this box, um, like you have done. So, thank you. Um, yeah. So we only focus on PyTorch and uh, familiarity, familiarity with it would help. And we have all the resources that you could ever ask for to go through um, that stuff. And if you wanted to look at that, all you need to do is go to the AI core GitHub. That is github.com slash AI dash core and go to uh, the neural networks repo here. And yeah, you can get, get all into PyTorch there. Also the PyTorch docs are sick, so you should definitely go there. Um, cool. Good questions, guys. 
So in this derivation, do we have a set number of policies to average over, or do we use every possible permutation of future action? Um, in which part? Uh, have set number of policies to average over. Um, so yeah, like the, the, the first thing here is like the first step, right? This computation is probably intractable. Um, if you have a, a somewhat complex game, like like chess, you know, there's an infinite number of ways to play chess because there's well, maybe not infinite, but like, I mean, yeah, basically there is an infinite because you can include the time the time step as a you know if, an input to your um, policy as well. But um, this is intractable. It's like we can't enumerate all of them. Like, and we're not actually going to do this. We're we're definitely not actually going to do this. It's, it's not possible. This is just like the maths of how to get to the Bellman optimality equation so we can check if we're acting optimally. But we definitely can't um, compute this. We can't iterate over all the policies because there's just so many. Um, okay. So, uh, so yeah, we definitely don't do that. That would be really hard. And yeah, intractable. All right, where are we at now? Cool, so I'm, I'm guessing everybody understands the Bellman optimality equation. We did this stuff, so we created a recursive definition for V star, and now we can use this to check is the left-hand side equal to the right-hand side for our current value states, uh, state values for all different states, and if it is, we must be acting optimally, so that's great. So what does the Bellman optimality equation say? It says, use our model to select the best action given all possible transitions based on what you return, what return you expect. Now we got that. How can we improve our agent's performance? The first thing we're going to look at, um, and it might be the only thing we get time for this session, is dynamic programming. Uh, dynamic program methods for computing value functions and improving policies. So the term dynamic programming is really just some bullshit that you need not worry about um, because it's just it's just a name that a guy came up with to please his um, superiors. So it didn't sound like he was. Uh, doing maths at the army base actually but dynamic programming is just a fancy way of saying we are going to have a model of the environment um, we are going to have a model of the environment a perfect model of the environment and what is a model well a model is this thing which i keep referring to is this thing we've seen so many times um yeah for the for the hundredth time it's the probability of moving into successor state s prime receiving a reward r given that you were in state s and you took action a and it always evaluates to a scalar a single number between zero and one because it's a probability and if you were to enumerate over all the different new states and rewards which you could experience then these would sum to one again because it's a probability cool so that's a model a model tells you how is the environment going to change. Um, obvious thing, we rarely have a model. Physics is a model that we use to model our real world. Um, and that is still just an approximation, obviously. Um, however, sometimes we do have a model. For example, in um, Gritty, with the deterministic environment, we know, like I've been saying, if we move to the right, if we take the action to go right, we're gonna end up in the state to the right as long as there is one. Um, and so in this case, like like I said, I, I can tell you what all those probabilities are given the state um, and the action. But, you know, they would change if there were any randomness in, um, in the environment. Randomness in the environment, not in the policy. The policy doesn't affect these numbers, but randomness in the environment does change the scalars um, which are output from this probability distribution. So that's what a model is. Um, and a model will also be referred to as a transition function from now. So it just defines how the environment transitions given these influences. So yeah, in this simple version of the game, we know this model. So we can actually write it here. That's what we've done. Um, this is the full transition function for the non-deterministic version of Gritty. Um, it, yeah, it fully defines exactly what you can expect. So what does it do? So what, what do we have here, right? We have a 
P S prime R given S A. That is a function which takes in um, uh, sorry, which takes in these things basically and gives you the gives you the probability of seeing these things. So it's a probability function which says given S and A, what's the you know what's the actual probability that I'm going to end up with? Um, oh, but in our case, that's deterministic. So we're not going to return a probability. We're actually just going to return like, hey, what is that new state? Um, because there's only going to be one of them. We have a different impl implementation somewhere where it returns you a list of all the um, new states and a list of all the new probabilities um, or, and, and rewards or something like that. Um, but yeah, this is the transition function for Gritty. So feel free to read through that and understand it if you want about how it's checking um, what column you're in, where you're going to end up and uh, what the reward is. So if we're in the goal, we get a reward and we get done. Um, cool. So now, uh, yeah, I'm going to take a break from my voice there. But tell me, why would we want a model? Why would a model be useful? Yeah, please ask any questions if you are any. And please, yeah, answer my question, which is how could we use a model? Like, why would that be useful? Um, we've, got, we've got all this way. So we know all about agents, environments, policies, the reinforcement learning setup. Um, we know about, um, yeah, returns and value functions and now we know about the Bellman optimality equation, and now we also know about models. So what can we do given that we know about all this stuff? I guess I'm going to answer it then. Um, I've already given the answer. How we could use a model. So basically, a model lets us know like what's the next what's the next state that could come. It could be used to predict different returns and value functions of different states, so that we can estimate an optimal policy. Predict different returns and value functions, of different states, so it can be used to estimate. An optimal policy. Cool, I like that. A need for a model implies a need for a prediction or a representation. I assume it's to be used to predict which actions we should take at a particular state to get the highest return. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean that is that is the that is the the goal of reinforcement learning. Really, is to um, predict which actions we should take at a uh, particular state to get a uh, to get the highest possible return. Um, so yes, and we are and basically yeah, we're gonna use prediction to make the we're gonna predict which actions they are. Um, it can be used to predict different returns and value functions or different states. We can use to estimate optimal policy. So again, yeah, it's like that's what we want to do, right? We want to know the value functions, we want to know the different states, and we want to estimate optimal policy. But this isn't what this isn't like 
the point of what a model does, right? What a model does is it, if you have it, you can, you know, you can basically simulate. You can simulate um, taking a particular state action pair and like, where do I end up? So what we can do with a model is we can say, given that I'm in state state S, what, and, and say, say like I have these four actions which I can take. Well, if I put all those um, actions into my model, given my current state, where am I gonna end up? So now you know all the different places where you can end up and we know those states. Now what we can do is we can simply say, um, well, I've already got a value function. Which of them has the highest value? So you can do this one step look ahead to um, to see what, it, one step look ahead into what states are reachable from here or which ones are most likely reachable um, and then evaluate how good they are using your value function and then you just move into the one or try to move into the one with the best value and that's how you can use a model um cool questions um as a baseline not really as a baseline no that's not what the model does but we will use baselines later i'll talk about that um forecasting an optimum improved model given those parameters so we're not forecasting um, the model, but we're forecasting kind of like the trajectory of the agent is what we could do with, uh, with, uh, with a model. In fact, with a model, like we don't just have to do, we're not limited to one step look ahead. We could do like a hundred step look ahead if we wanted, because we, we can simulate what are all the possible routes, you know, from here, and then what are all the possible routes from each of those. So we could do like a full tree search over the next um, different states and try and take take a path down there. However, like it's extremely, you know, like I said, we're going to be dealing with problems where like the state space is extremely large, the action space is extremely large. Um, so the branching factor of that tree, which you would have to tree search, is large, and hence the tree is is not enumerable. You can't brute force um, these problems, which we're going to look at. Or at least like that's just not the best way to do it um that's not an intelligent thing to do and we want to build artificial intelligence um so um cool all right so what's the state we input into the transition function um whichever one we want we can pick any state which we want to say what is the probability of moving into s prime and receiving reward r um for that state given action A. So we, we could do that for any of them. What we will do is we'll do it for our current state. So we'll look at where we are currently and then where could I go from here, evaluate how good I expect each of those um, states to be and then move into the one where um, the value is highest, where I predict it is highest. Cool. Yeah, let me know if that doesn't make sense. Right, for now, what are we doing? We can run this transition function. So we just define that, don't worry about it too much. Um, and yeah, here's what I've described. So um, if we have a model, we can look ahead at successor states reachable from the current state. Um, yeah, we can do that. And if we had a way to estimate the value function, then we could look into them and look at the value function and just try to go into the one with the highest value. Um, acting greedily with respect to the value function um, for optimal policy will produce optimal behavior. Acting greedily means just like taking the highest um, taking the best action at the current time step for like the very next time step. Um, so yeah, just looking one step ahead. Um, and yeah, if we if we act greedily with respect to the value function, that is we always move into the state with the highest value function, um, given that we're following an optimal policy, then we'll produce optimal behavior. So um, here, these numbers are the optimal value functions, um, the optimal state values for greedy. Um, and so th this is V star, these numbers, they represent V star. Well, if we act greedily with respect to it, like always moving into um, uh, the, always moving into the next reachable state, um, which has the highest value function, well then we can, um, yeah, well then we'll act optimal. Like all of these um, are optimal paths. Um, and I've just drawn many different paths to show you that like, there's not just one optimal policy either. You can have, um, yeah, you can have many different optimal policies. Cool. Uh, 
but there may not always be many autumn pulses. Um, so yeah, let's let's do this. Let's do some computing value functions by dynamic programming. Um, so the first one is called uh, policy iteration. This is the first thing we're going to do. So what policy iteration does is it basically um, does two things in um, in alternation. It firstly does this thing called policy evaluation. So this is the process of approximately um, evaluating the value function on the current policy. So we've got some current policy defines how we're going to act right now. Um, and we're basically, um, we're going to evaluate how good these states are using the model. Um, how do we do that? Well, the Bellman equations define the value of any state recursively as a function of its successor state. And we know that if we, can, we can use our model to simulate the next state, the successor states that the agent will move into by taking any given action. Um, and that defines um, what rewards we might receive. So given this, along with the fact that our value table already contains the estimates, um, the sentence just ends here. So um, given the fact that um, the Bellman uh, equation um, allows us to define the value function recursively and simulate the next, uh, um, the next steps, then yeah, then basically we can evaluate the value function, function for this current policy. Um, the policy improvement step is the second part, and this is where we look at the the value function which we've um, which we've evaluated given the current policy, and then we change the policy. We change the policy, making it greedy with respect to the current value function. So it's like change value function, change policy, change value function, change policy, um, and we just do this in a loop basically. So here's the full policy um, iteration algorithm. And it looks like this. So we randomly initialize a value function for all the different states in the state space. Um, and then we just loop, do the, the policy evaluation. What does that look like? It says for each of the different states, um, basically use the Bellman equation as an update rule. So we're trying to, uh, this, is, this is the Bellman equation basically, where we, um, where we uh, had the left-hand side VS and the right-hand side the weighted sums of the um, of the rewards, the Bellman equation we saw earlier actually had the um, the average over. Um, we're going to have this just look back at that. Um, had the expectation over um, over the policy pi, um, but here we're just going to remove that policy pi and like do it many times um, so that it so that it equates to that average. Um, so we're just basically going to do this until the Bellman error gets below some threshold. And at that point, we think that we found the correct value function for this, um, uh, for this current policy. And then, so now we've got, now we've found the, um, found the value function. We do policy improvement and set the new policy pi prime equal to, um, this, this term is just what's here that is like the VS. So basically just like we set it to the argument, uh, sorry, we, we, we find the action which maximizes the value function for that state, right? Um, so for that state, we just set the policy equal to a deterministic policy, which will always choose to, to tell you to take the action, which leads to the highest, um, the highest VS, right? Cool, so yeah, this says, Choose the action that maximizes the return, averaged over all possible transitions using our model. Um, and then we just do this until um, until the policy stops changing. And when the policy stops changing, we can assume that we have reached an optimal policy. Cool. Does this converge to an optimal policy? That's the question. Um, basically. Yes, is the answer. Um, not much explanation here, um, but this is a diagram of kind of the visualization of what happens. So it's like, we start off with some random value function and some random policy. Um, and what we do, the first step, which is pulling us towards this line, is we do policy evaluation. So we look at all the current states, um, we evaluate their um, 
average returns using the current policy and then we um, and what that leads us to is having a new value for v for some particular state so we find the true value function for all different states um, and now we've got some new value function and the policy is still the same but the value function has changed so maybe the policy will as well and if we then do policy um, improvement well then what we do is we set the um, the policy equal to the greedy of the that should be a v ignore that pi that's a v the value um, so the policy should be greedy with respect to the value function so we get a new value function use that new value function to get a new policy by acting greedy with respect to it now that we've got this new policy um, the value function might have changed because I might now be taking different actions in different in different states hence meaning that the particular state is better or worse so now we need to do policy evaluation again change the um, yeah, change the uh, change the, the value function and then we just do this recursively and eventually we end up at the point where um, uh, basically the finding the, the optimal value function for this current policy doesn't change the policy and this will give us an optimal um, policy and value function if we have an optimal value function we have an optimal policy if we have an optimal policy um, we have an optimal value function so okay um, what are we what are we doing here now um, we are going to initialize the value table so we're actually going to have our own value table which in our case is just going to be a dictionary which maps the state the integer representation of the state to the um, value which we have currently um, so we're just going to initialize that with each of them randomly uh, and then return that value table and we'll also initialize the deterministic policy um, which takes in you know 16 states and returns four actions by default so the policy maps states to actions. So for each of these different states, we're just gonna um, choose a random action here. You're gonna implement that. Um, and then we're gonna do this, um, oh, we're gonna do all of this. So firstly, um, let's just do these two. So put, you know, the short code, we've basically already done it, um, which goes there for evaluating um, the policy. So choosing a random action to initialize the determinist policy. Um, and then we'll actually do the uh, computing the value function. So we'll get the new value table, we'll see if it's converged, not, it hasn't obviously to start with. Um, and then we're gonna sweep over all the different states many different times, and we're gonna continually um, push them equal to uh, the thing we saw above. So we're gonna use the model to simulate um, what's the new state and what's the reward. And um, and then we are going to set the new value for this uh, for this state doing this thing, right? We're just gonna weight it by the probability. Like I said, in our case, this is gonna be one um, for the states which are returned from our transition function. And, um, and then we're gonna update that in the value table. And then we're gonna basically see um, what's the difference between the new value and the old value for the state because we want to check when does it when does it stop changing um, so when does this value function converge that's how many times we're going to do this for um, and then we're going to look at like okay what's the worst error um, for all the different states and if the worst error is below some threshold then we're going to say cool we've converged and then set converged equal to something which is not false and then we are going to update the um, the value function to be equal to the, uh, the new value table which we've got and then eventually after we've converged we'll return the new value table so yeah we'll just do that like let's spend like five minutes doing that um have a code break and then i will come back then
All right. So I hope you got somewhere with that. Um, any issues? Doesn't seem like it. So what do we do here? Uh, we're gonna choose a random action, just like uh, we did before. np dot random dot rand int. So from numpy, use the random module and use a random integer. Get a random integer between. Um, I don't know. Can I just put num actions? So I can just put uh, num actions there. So this is gonna give me a random number up to, uh, but not including four. Run that, nice. Um, now I need to implement this um, dynamic programming we've done above. So what is this, right? Um, okay, so I'm basically gonna look at every state and I'm gonna get the action according to the current policy. So how do I do that? Well, I just get the, um, uh, not, I want to do the policy. So we're taking in a policy, um, and this is going to um, map a state to an action. Cool. New state, reward done. Um, what is that? Uh, well, it's obvious. Um, there's only one thing that returns those three things, but we know it's the, the model. Um, the model is going to look at the current state. It's going to return us what's the new state I'm going to go into, um, and what's the reward I'm going to get from that. What do we call it? We call it model transition. Transition um, of state. Okay. And action, I think. All right. That's what this takes in. So it takes in the state and the action. It's going to return us to new state reward done. So now we know um, what action are we going to take in, um, in this uh, using our deterministic policy in this state. Um, what is that going to lead us into what new state and what reward and then okay cool now I'm going to calculate the new value using that right so there's two instances here one where I'm not done and one where otherwise I, I am done so what happens here right what is this value going to be set equal to it's going to be set equal to this arrow says um, it's going to be equal to the average of the um, of the return from there, right? Of the expected return. Um, so using this next uh, reward and then the discounted next uh, value function. In our case, again, for the 10th time, this is gonna be, um, everything's gonna be zero except for um, the one probability, which will be a one for the probability of moving to S prime. So in our case, we don't even need this um, because we're just gonna get back S prime and that's the only one which is gonna have any effect on what this should be. So this is basically the part we need to take. We need to take the reward and then add gamma multiplied by um, V S prime for that. However, in the case where this is our terminal state, there is no going to there's not going to be any S prime. In which case, we won't need um, yeah we won't have an S prime and we won't need to add that to our current reward. So that's what these um, different uh, uh, blocks are here. So if we're not done, well the value is going to be the reward plus um, we have uh, discount factor, yeah. Discount factor uh, multiplied by um, the value function, so the value table which we have of the next state. So new state, right? Simple as that. Um, and then the new value, if we are done, is just going to be the reward because there's no uh, there's no new state. Cool. So now the new value table um, the new uh, the new value table contains an entry for the current state, which is equal to that new value. So cool. Um, and then the delta. Okay. Well, what's the um, difference between the new val and the old val for the state? Well, um, we know new val already, and we just need to calculate the difference between um, that new val and the old val, which was the um, value table. value table of the state 
Right. So this is the old value. It's the old value here. Um, this is the old value for this state that we're looking at currently. And then we're going to check the worst value function um, error. So basically, um, for this whole, so what we're doing is we're sweeping over all of the states. And okay, when we look over all of them, I'm going to initialize my worst delta as zero. For the first one, I'm going to get some delta, which is the error. This is like how different is my new value to my old value. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to basically see is this the worst one so far? So um, we will just, yeah, basically do this check here. So if this current delta for this state is worse than the worst one, um, then we will make our va uh, variable called worst delta equal to this one, which is the worst so far. Then we'll print that. Um, and then we will continue to do this for different states. Um, and then we'll check if it's converged after we've gone through all of the states. So we'll look at, is the worst delta lower than the error threshold, which is a parameter that we pass in here. Um, and then, um, and if we've converged, then we'll set converged equal to true. And then we'll set the, the value table equal to the new value table with the new values in. Cool. And then we'll return that new value table. So I think that's gonna be good. Right now, um, have a bit more to do. So um, yeah, go ahead and try and basically look through these. So this one's a simple one. Um, this is improving the policy. So given um, given the new value table which you've got, and um, and the discount factor. Don't know when we're going to use that, but um, we basically need to look at each state. And then evaluate the the best um, the best uh, the best action to take. Um, that's why we're going to use the discount factor. And then basically um, find which whichever state has the highest value and set that equal to um, the output of the policy for that state. Okay. So you can read all the comments. It describes pretty much what to do. Um, I haven't gone through this code in a while since we made it, but um, you know you can see I'm just reading through the comments and. And writing down what I say um, and then then we can put in this whole policy iteration algorithm which basically just can uh, does the two different parts we've um, we've uh, just programmed so it does these two functions does policy evaluation and policy improvement in a loop while the policy is not stable checks if it's stable and then returns you the optimal policy after um, so yes um, just have a go at that for five minutes and then we'll come back again at 2129 ask questions as well please 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 ask questions
Okay, back. Yeah, please ask any questions you have. So, um, what do we do now? We need to do the policy improvement step, right? So what happens here? Um, well, we want to loop over each state. So um, we do, let's say, yeah, so we use the variable state down here. So for state in uh, range 16, um, we could set that programmatically maybe as well if we had extra arguments like we do in in this function, don't know why it's not there, but yeah, we got 16 states here, and they're all integers, so we want to um, take each of them, and then we want to calculate uh, the best value. So, we're, so we want to basically look over all the different, um, all the different actions. Oh, no, sorry, all, all the different um, successor states, and see which of those has the best um, has the best value. So, to start with, we'll just um, initialize our best value as negative infinity. So we can do negative float infinity. That's how you get an, an, infinite, an infinite number in Python. And then, um, yeah, no best action found yet. So we'll just do none for that. Um, and then for the, um, yeah, so this is what we're gonna do within, side, within this loop. Um, but this here, so basically we're going to go over each different state and each different, um, uh, no, not for each different state. We're going to, sorry, we're going to go for it for over each different action. So for each action in range in action space, which I've defined up here for some reason, um, and then we can go new state reward equals okay well what is the new state and the reward where does that come from um well that comes from what does that come from use the model so yeah we're going to use transition um on the state and the action to see what new state do i get and what reward do i get so the transition function models what's going to happen next what new state and reward will i get um given that takes state Give them in state and take action, um, and then if I'm not done, um, same thing as we did above, basically. Um, what's the the value going to be for a non-terminal state? Well, it's going to be the reward plus the discount factor uh, multiplied by the um, uh, the value function, the value table in our case for the new state and then the value is going to be um if if we are done it's just going to be the reward right because there was no next state um now we're gonna basically check uh is this value of taking this action in this state um well basically is the value of the state which we would be led into if we took that action from the state we're in is that the best value so far? So the best value initially was negative infinity. Now I'm going to say, okay, well, if it is better than negative infinity, which it surely will be, um, then this is the best value so far, at least on the first run. Um, and then this is the best action on, on the, um, uh, yeah, so far. And then, so after we have um, considered all the different actions, now we've got the best value and the best action. Then we could do new policy of this state. Well, what's the policy? It maps states to actions. So I want this one to take the best action. And I'm going to return that new policy. And here we are going to um, do check stable policy. I'll take the old policy. I'll take the new policy. Um, by default, um, it'll be true. 
and then here I will just do like for um, uh, for state in um, I could even do old policy dot uh, keys. Uh, so for all the different um, all the different keys, which are all the different integer states in my old policy, um, then what do I need to do? Um, I'm basically going to say is uh, I'm going to say if um, old policy uh, state um, is not equal to new policy state. That is, if each of the policies say if they don't agree on everything, well, then I'm going to say this is uh, false. So I could return false, or I could say stable equals false. And then in the end, I'm going to return stable, right? So basically, for all the different um, keys, which are the states in my original policy, or my old policy, I'm going to compare the the, um, the, val the action which that policy says to take with the action the new policy says to take. And then if um, they're not equal, I'm going to return false. Run that. Just to find those two things and now the policy iteration algorithm so this is where you put it all together so the value table we're going to use the first um, one we did initialize value table um, gonna, uh, yeah, put that there um, initialize deterministic policy got this here and then policy stable initialize it as false um, policy index, so how many policies have we tried so far, starting at zero. So while the policy is not stable until the policy converges through policy iteration, um, what we're going to do is we're going to say the value table is equal to, well, we're going to do, um, what is it we're going to do? We're going to do, uh, what do we call it? Valuation, policy evaluation, policy evaluation. Okay. And then simply here, we're going to do policy improvement. Cool, simple as that. Um, although they need to take some things in, don't they? Um, so policy evaluation needs to take the policy, the value table and the discount factor. Um, so let's give it the policy so far, um, the value table and the discount factor. By default 0.9 um, and then we'll do policy improvement which requires us to give it the value table and the discount factor cool and then once we've um, converged on the value function and then iterate the policy we'll check was this new policy equal to my old policy in which case I've convert I've converged um, so yeah, and then we just use my, my function, check stable policy to compare those two policies. So for each different action, do they give you three different states, they give the same action. Um, and if they do, then um, that's good and we've converged. If not, then we'll keep going and do the same thing repeatedly. And then at the end of this, um, we'll set my policy equal to the new policy. And um, Cool. So here, uh, yeah. So then the policy stable becomes true, and then this this loop will not continue. So then we'll do ultimate policy, print the ultimate policy, and then we'll return that um, that policy and that value table map. Okay. Cool. So let's run that. Get an error. Dict object is not callable. Um, yeah. Policy state one. Policy evaluation, policy state. So policy is currently a, um, a dictionary, even though I keep calling it a value uh, yeah, a function. Cool, too many values to unpack. Um, transition, new state. Uh, 
equals the return, transition returns, new state, reward, and done. Uh, so we need to get not just new state reward, we need to get new state reward done and then run that. And then cool, there we have found um, an optimal policy. Um, so what does this look like, right? Well, one is to uh, go down, I think. Um, so you can see basically there's like everywhere, go down until we're on the last row and then go to the right. Um, and we can check if that's, if, if that's right by um, visualizing our agent. So here, we have a function which um, it, it turns a, the, 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 the policy into a function. So it takes in the dictionary and then returns it, um, uh, returns a function which basically uses that dictionary. Um, so you can call it like we had with our earlier policy, which we passed into um, into our visualize agent, and we can run this, and then you see now looks like anywhere the agent lands it is acting optimally. So just view that again. Anywhere it starts, yeah. So I was right with the um, with the uh, the the indication of the numbers. So it looks like everywhere it goes down, except when it's on the bottom row. In which case it just goes to the right. So that that is an optimal policy. Another optimal policy, just to prove that there would be there there can be more than one, would be always go to the right, except when you're on the far column, and then go down. That would also be optimal. Cool. Are there any questions at this point? We just did um, a value. Oh, sorry, policy iteration, which was crazy. Nice. All right. Sweet. Yeah. Just just throw some questions in there. Um, but yeah, if there's anything that's unclear, honestly, if there's anything that's unclear, we we'll definitely make sure to answer it. Um, cool. Um, all right, I'm just gonna take a, a little, a uh, few minute break there, I'm gonna look ahead, and then. Um, I'm back to that. All right, guys. Um, yeah, I'm actually going to call the session here. It's getting pretty late, and uh, we've already got like loads of the way through this. It'll be great exercise if you guys can do the um, the second algorithm, value iteration, which is extremely simple and well, extremely similar to um, policy iteration. It literally just the same thing, just with less steps. Um, check that out. Check out these equations and the nice diagram. Um, change in the update rule and then implement this there's just one code cell and if you can do that then you are totally on the way to being able to yeah implement some really impressive stuff um and honestly yeah just to say like this this course is not it's, it's already been pretty deep you know it's like it's not easy and if you can do this 
um, then you are absolutely within the top minute fraction of people in the world even um, because it's really state-of-the-art and very few people can code very few people can do machine learning very few people <laughs> can actually do both even if they say they can um, but if you can do this and you follow along so far then you're one of those people and this is only the beginning of what we're going to teach over the next four weeks um, and it's going to be <laughs> way more interesting and way more impressive and we are going to solve these games um, we're going to solve <laughs> not just that one um, we're going to solve which ones can't remember where they are yeah we're going to solve Lunar Lander um, which one we're going to do next week we're going to do uh, Cart Pole um, and the same algorithms you can apply to any of these um, any of these different environments you can even make your own environments you can even get onto these ones um, yeah the Majoko ones or the robotics ones um, so yeah really on the way I'll be here just for a few more minutes and just literally throw any questions um, you have and definitely make sure to answer them um, yeah let us know what you thought of that session as well apologies again the lobby's not working I don't know what's happening because um, they worked out there on test but we're going to figure that out ASAP cool or even like I'm just gonna say that session was epic and if you agree then upvote that's what I say upvote that if you think that session was epic I personally do Is it possible to look at a model-based RL? Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah, we can definitely do that. Um, well, I mean, this is model-based actually. So dynamic programming is, is model-based um, because you've got a model, right? You'll take an advantage of the fact that we have that transition function. Um, and yeah, basically we can use that to look ahead. And that's one form of model-based RL. Um, but yeah, we definitely want to build build more on this and another note is that We want this course to help us find the people who are gonna Teach the next version of the same course and also to help us develop the future courses. So um, We'll be doing open hacking throughout this week and if you want to come along on video chat and basically say hi and uh, Discuss getting involved like honestly, there's there's like a, a sick team of people here um, just working on awesome stuff um to put out content like this um visualizations other projects um revenue generating products which we've made um all kinds of stuff so if you want to get involved then just keep an eye out for the um the media which we will be putting out about open hacking and other sessions and ways you can meet us and ways you can get involved so yeah um really excited for that definitely want to get in touch with you all do these approaches stop these algorithms when we move on to continuous states rather than discrete states? Would we only be able to apply this if we have extract discrete macro states? Um, I mean, yeah, that's definitely one way to do it. Um, yeah, I don't know too much about that actually. Um, we can look into that shortly. Great question though. Come to open hacking and we can talk about it. Cool. Oh, that session was epic. Two people said. All right, cool. I'm gonna drop off. Um, thank you all for being here. Thank you all for staying for so long. My browser encountered an error while decoding the video. Hope that doesn't happen to all of you, but again, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for coming along. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Please drop any feedback in this chat. Please drop any questions in this chat. Um, and we will be in touch shortly for the next session. And like I said, you're well on your way. 
to being far within that very small fraction of people who can do this shit. So thank you so much and have a good night. AI Core out. Peace.